Good afternoon once again to everybody, and I think we're now set to begin this prestigious event. But for now, what a glorious moment to start this afternoon with a smile. And since I cannot see you beyond the screen, I hope you're all well, safe, and sound. Hello, my name is Thresha Dar from the SOFIA organization, and I will be your host for the 8th Virginia Hill Jaime Lecture with this year's topic, Humanistic Buddhism for a World in Crisis. Indeed, it is essential to peer at the world in a different perspective, most especially given that the world we live in today suffers from a grave crisis. I hope you are all in for this ride because we're about to venture to a new dimension of learning. But first, I would want to express how surprised and glad I am to see a diverse group joining us today not only from the Philippines, but also abroad. With that, I would like to acknowledge some of our esteemed guests coming from different institutions. Um, we have in the list um, Nantian Institute Australia, University of the West, the University of Hong Kong, Wang Ming College, San Carlos Seminary Cebu, Cebu Technological School, DepEd Philippines superintendents and faculty. Of course, our friends and colleagues from the University of San Carlos and some institutions that I failed to mention, but we truly welcome and warmly welcome you all for today's event. Now to give his welcoming remarks to everyone present, let us all hear from our beloved department chairman, Dr. Ruby Suazo. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruby Suazo, and it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Department of Philosophy of the University of San Carlos to welcome you here today. We are delighted to have you with us to participate and share in the 8th Virginia Jaime Lecture to honor the valuable contribution of Dr. Virginia Jaime to the Department of Philosophy as a former chair who dedicated her life for the growth of philosophy education. Her quiet devotion to doing research in philosophy has been an inspiration to many who fondly knew her. Thank you for joining us. Before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us make this event to become a reality. The SOFIA organization, the student organization of the Department of Philosophy under the leadership of Tresha Dar and their advisor, Ms. Mage Purino, and the faculty members of the Department of Philosophy of the University of San Carlos. And of course, the guest lecturer of this event, who will be formally introduced later. We couldn't have done this event without you. The Department of Philosophy is committed to engage in philosophical training, religious education, spiritual formation, research and community services or extension services for social transformation in the spirit of prophetic dialogue. In line with this commitment, most especially during this time of the world in crisis, having this lecture is timely and necessary. Prepare yourself, therefore, to be challenged and inspired. Once again, I want to say that on behalf of the Department of Philosophy of the University of San Carlos, welcome. It's my pleasure to see you, to see so many of you here online. Thank you. Thank you for that, Department Chair Dr. Ruby Suazo. And I know you are all excited to meet our lovely guest speaker today, and I am too. But before that, to give a little background about our guest, let me call on our admirable faculty advisor, Dr. Mage Purino. Good afternoon, everyone. Our speaker is head of program for Humanistic Buddhism, director of the Humanistic Buddhism Center, and senior lecturer at Nantian Institute in Australia. She teaches subjects related to Humanistic Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism. She holds a PhD in Religious Studies, a Master of Arts in Buddhist Studies, a Master of Business Administration, and a Master of Science in Computer Science and Engineering. She began her career as Allied Research and Development 
engineer in artificial intelligence systems in the 1980s and moved on to management positions in Singapore's statutory bodies. She made her millennial decision to join the Fo Guangshan Order. Her published work is entitled Parading the Buddha, Localizing Buddha's Birthday Celebration. Colleagues and friends, our speaker is perhaps one of the most sought after speakers in humanistic Buddhism today. She initiated the formation of communities of practice which now has global reach. And she is also a dedicated servant of the Dharma. May I present to you our speaker, my teacher, Venerable Dr. Zhuwe Wei. Thank you so much, Dr. Mage Perino, for your generous introduction, this kind invitation, and all the logistics involved to coordinate across time zones. It seems to me that you respond to my query so quickly that you never sleep. Auspicious greetings, respected reverends, ladies, and gentlemen. May I thank also the University of San Carlos for organizing today's lecture. It is indeed such a privilege and an honor to be your lecturer for the eighth, Virginia L. Hemi lecture. And uh, may I also thank Dr. Ruby Swatzel, Chair of the Department of Philosophy, the student organization, SOFIA, for organizing everything. I look forward to getting to know you more, as well as the, the feeling. I, I really enjoy this feeling that I feel like I'm part of your family and I'm a friend of the Philippines. When I watched your earlier video of the University of San Carlos, it makes me feel like I'm at home. It reminds me of my time back in Asia. And of course, I'm indebted to everyone online for taking the time to be here with me today. So if you just give me a, a few seconds, I'm now going to share screen and let's test the technology. Okay, let me see. Can you tell me if you see the screen? All right. Okay, good. Thank you. Please allow me to begin with a beautiful tradition from the land on which I reside today, and that's Australia. We often begin any official function by acknowledging the country that we are in. So I would like to acknowledge the Darawal people as the traditional owners of the land on which Nantian Institute resides. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all are. And I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of indigenous peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters on which we now have the privilege to enjoy. Since we've come from a variety of appointments and possibly even lunch, may I suggest that we begin by checking in both body and mind. The Nantian Institute uses contemplative pedagogy in our classrooms and we often begin with a short check-in. So if you will allow me, I'd like to use our Nantian Institute's Mindful Check-in app to allow our minds to settle and bodies to rest. It is now time to check in. From wherever you've come, that is now behind you. Let's focus on the present, because there is nothing more important than the gift of the moment. Please ensure that you are in a safe place. You may either sit or stand with your spine upright. 
If your legs are crossed, uncross them. Place your hands on your sides or on your lap. Gently close your eyes. We will begin by scanning the body for any areas of tightness and relaxing those tensions. Let's start from the top of your head. Relax. Relax your forehead, your eyes, your ears, your facial muscles, your lips. Relax. Feel tensions evaporating from your head. And now, let's move on to your neck muscles. Relax. Shoulders. Upper arms. Lower arms. Hands. Fingers. Slowly. Let them go. Now work your way down the spinal cord. Relax one vertebra at a time. Your thigh muscles. Calf muscles. Your feet, toes, feel all tensions melting into Mother Earth. The next step is to scan for any remaining areas of tension and anxieties. Honor them and the conditions that have led to their arising. Gently, ever so gently, let these tensions and anxieties out of the body and your system. Now that the body is completely relaxed, Let's slowly bring your attention to the tip of your nose. Breathe. Watch every in-breath and out-breath, without control and without judgment. There is nowhere else to go and nothing else to do. Simply continue to watch your breath until you hear the sound of the bell. It is now time to check in. From wherever you've come, that is slowly low behind you. Bring your awareness away from the breath to your ears. Hear what is going on around you. Still maintaining a quiet body and mind. Gradually, Move your attention to the eyes. Gently open your eyes and smile. 
be grateful to all the conditions that give you whatever you have before you. You are now ready for the miraculous moment to be the best that you can be. Thank you for joining me in this precious practice. I hope that everyone is now feeling very checked in for what's to come in the next hour. In 2014, Laurie Zoloff, the then president of the American Academy of Religion, issued an urgent appeal to the 10,000 religious scholars in her membership. She asked them to, one, pay attention to the warnings of the IPCC, which is the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Two, to let the findings of the sciences interrupt our lives. And finally, to devote serious attention to researching solutions to the problem of climate change. And that's coming from someone from the religions side of things. Zulov ended with a prophetic call to action, and I quote, to warn, to speak of the possibility of our power and our responsibility, and who interrupted you and told you to let the call of the stranger stop you in your tracks, and the brokenness of the earth call you to action. I wanted to be the one who said to you, stop, stop and start. And now all of this, this world, this organization, this the greatest moral question of our time, it is completely in your hands. I know your power and what we can do. Stand with me. Let us begin." Unquote. So let us pause for a moment to reflect on the call. We make moral choices. We also teach and lead. We meet people and demonstrate to them our moral agency through the words we choose to use and the behavior we choose to enact. People, be it our children, students, devotees or patients, look to us for solutions and guidance. Yes, we have power and responsibility. The moral question we face is not only the greatest, but also the most urgent. There was and is no time to lose. Almost 10 years later, her cry for religious studies scholars and theologians, and I'm sure there must be philosophers among them, to do something about the climate crisis still haunts my heart, especially now that an interruption is forced upon us globally and suddenly. Except that now the situation has worsened. Paul Crutzen coined the term Anthropocene to mark the end of more than a hundred thousand year record of a geological epoch called the Holocene. The Holocene is known for its stable living conditions that nourished human civilization as we know today. It all vanished about 1950, which was only 71 years ago, which means some of us in the audience have lived through two ecological periods. About 1950, there was a marked change of the Earth's atmospheric carbon dioxide and surface temperature, largely due to a rapid rise of human activities leading to the onset of the Anthropocene. If you are interested, I highly recommend watching Will Steffen's The Anthropocene, Where on Earth Are We Going on YouTube, as well as David Attenborough's documentaries, such as A Life on Our Planet, which he calls his witness statement of how Earth changed in his lifetime. 
the global interruption caused by an army of invisible spike proteins that we are all now very familiar with brought with it a silver lining. In a stunning documentary, The Year Earth Changed, Attenborough showed how the healing process took place in the oceans, atmosphere, and on land. Attenborough's recent production, together with Johann Rothström on Breaking Boundaries, the Science of Our Planet, offers hope on how we can restore the boundaries threatening our ecosystem. They are rather simple. One, plant trees. Two, adopt a plant-based diet. Three, reduce waste. And four, use renewable sources of energy. They sound like four easy steps, but yet something is stopping us to save ourselves from the sixth mass extinction. What could that be? To look at the answers, I turn away from an exploration of this external environment to something else. The internal environment of our minds. Let me quote Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung, who writes in The Symbolic Life, and I quote, Indeed, it is becoming ever more obvious that it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself who is man's greatest danger for the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic epidemics, which are infinitely more devastating than the worst of natural catastrophes." Unquote. What are these psychic epidemics that Jung referred to? Psychic epidemics happen when masses of people are caught up in unwholesome mental states, such as delusion, fear, hatred, or anxiety. Add to that fake news that go viral, we end up with the perfect catalyst for wrong actions. One driving mental factor is fear. In how fear works, 21st century sociologist Frank Faraday writes, and I quote, young people are socialized to feel fragile and overawed by uncertainty. And as a result, the defining feature of the current Western 21st century version of personhood is its vulnerability. Although society still upholds the ideal of self-determination and autonomy, the values associated with them are increasingly overridden by a message that stresses the quality of human weakness. And if vulnerability is indeed the defining feature of the human condition, it follows that being fearful is the normal state, unquote. There is certainly value in vulnerability, but fear is counterproductive. Throughout history, we see that flourishing societies show immense capacity to innovate and take risks in the face of an uncertain future and to display courage in the presence of danger. And we're seeing a lot of that in this day and age because of the pandemic we are all engulfed in. Now add to that formula of vulnerability and fear a recent phenomenon, digital media use at a rate never seen before. In 2019, a global team of researchers from Australia and the UK published The Online Brain, how the internet may be changing our cognition. Evidence in the study reveals that the internet can produce both acute and sustained alterations in our attentional capacities at the expense of sustained concentration, memory processes, shifting the way we retrieve, store, and even value knowledge and social connection and social processes, creating a new interplay between the internet and our social lives, including our self-esteem. I think these findings are very important for the educators among us. So not only are many people globally addicted to digital media use, especially with stay-at-home orders, 
but the impact is also both psychological and physiological. The structure of our brain is slowly but surely undergoing change. What I've tried to highlight in the very short introduction is that the challenges facing humanity now occur both in the external environment and also in the internal mind. And one is feeding the other. In Buddhist terminology, I see this as systemic collective karma. With such complexities, there cannot be a simple solution. However, I can attempt to make sense of the situation using a Buddhist lens. Just now I introduced a Buddhist term, karma. It is really quite difficult to explain what karma is. So let me attempt a, a simplified model. We can look upon karma as a cause and effect loop. That is, our past actions affect us now, and our present actions will affect us in the future. Karma is not an external force, nor a system of punishment or reward dealt, by, dealt out by any external entity. Buddhists see karma as a natural law. Karma can operate at an individual level, but given how interconnected we are today, karma can also operate at a collective level. So when I said systemic collective karma earlier, I meant that now systems and structures are enshrining certain behaviors and hence resulting in predictable consequences. And we will return to this in a little while. For now, please allow me to move on to a quick introduction on how our sensorium works. And then I will explain how some Buddhist scholars and teachers see an individual's delusive behavior becoming collective karma. Contact, feeling, ideation, and volition arise from the coming together of three factors, which are the presence of a sensory object, a functioning sense organ, and consciousness. Together, these three factors make up the sensorium. So one sensory object may be a cup of tea. A functioning sense organ may be our eyes. When light bounces off the cup of tea and enters our eyes, it forms an imprint in our consciousness that recognizes the imprint as a cup of tea. At that moment, our visual consciousness becomes active. So taking a closer look at consciousness, a set of literature called the Abhidharma. It's a commentarial set of literature in the Buddhist texts. The Abhidharma divides consciousness into six types. Eye or visual consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. Then there's another school within Buddhism called the Yogacara school. And it further adds two more consciousnesses, which are ego consciousness and storehouse consciousness. So let's talk about the storehouse consciousness first. While the storehouse appears to be constant and permanent, it is not. Instead, it is a series of continuous consciousness imprints. So anything that we see, that we hear, that we smell, that we taste, that we touch, and that we think about cause an imprint that is stored somewhere in this storehouse consciousness. Now, I want to turn to an ancient Greek philosopher called Heraclitus. He's thought to have said this quote, you cannot step into the same river twice for other waters are continually flowing on, unquote. While most people take Heraclitus to mean that all things are changing and so we cannot encounter the same phenomenon twice, Markovich in 1967 argues for something more profound and subtle. It is that some things stay the same only because they are changing. Heraclitus believes in flux not to destroy constancy. 
So rather paradoxically, flux is a necessary condition of constancy. So back to this storehouse consciousness, it can be understood in precisely the same way as living and present due to its state of flux. So personally, I find this insight profound for there is no need to resist volatility because flux is necessary for constancy. The other interesting consciousness that this Buddhist school introduced is the ego consciousness. This ego consciousness misconceives the storehouse consciousness as the self. And together, they give an illusion of the subjectivity of our experience. Don't you often think that today's me is the same as yesterday's me and that my ideas are irrefutably true? Now we know that comes from this ego consciousness. Buddhists believe that sentient beings are constituted by how we respond to and interpret what we discern through our sensorium. That is how cognition determines what we become. So if something is out of my sensorium field, then that would not exist. For example, anything only perceivable in the infrared zone is not going to be visible to me and hence will not constitute any part of my experience. The reverse is also true. So the external world is a manifestation of our internal consciousness. For example, as a Buddhist, when I see a Buddha statue, I see the symbolic representation of a world teacher and that he should be placed on an altar. However, to a non-Buddhist, he or she may see the Buddha statue as a piece of art or as a door stopper. Now, according to a Buddhist scholar, Dan Lustus, cognition shapes our actions, emotions, concerns, and orientations. As we loop through the seeds that are stored in the storehouse consciousness, we grasp ideas of physical objects that already have an imprint in our storehouse consciousness, thereby reinforcing what we already know. Gradually, we become what we buy, what social media notifications we pay attention to, what fake news we read, and what fears we feed. We forge our sense and meaning of the world in our own image, and then devote our lives to pursuing and clinging to it. Hence, it is our behavior or our individual karma that brings about the so-called arising of the world through patterns of cyclic causality. William Waldron astutely summarizes with the observation that any afflictive dispositions such as craving and aggression are gradually reinforced by the very actions they instigate. If there's one statement that can summarize this long introductory section, it is I want, therefore I become. Our habits or karma form an appropriational circuit between me, the grasper, such as the need to feel popular, and the grasped, such as the number of likes on social media. Through language, sensation, reason, belief, etc., I become more and more what I crave and to become angry when what I crave is endangered. Hence, I need more, more, and more. This sense of lack remains a constant, but our collective reaction to it has become the need for unhealthy growth, very often disguised as the good life of consumerism and the gospel of sustained economic growth. According to David Loy, the fundamental defect of any economic system that requires continual growth to survive is that it is not based on needs, but on fear. A fear that feeds on and feeds our sense of lack. Does this idea resonate with you? Think back over some of your own desires. Where do you think they come from? 
Could that come from a sense of lack in you? Could the sense of lack come from how you shaped or want to shape your identity? Could that identity image come from something you knew, heard, or have seen that left an imprint in your storehouse consciousness? According to existential psychologists, our biggest repression is death. Although fear of death is necessary for self-preservation, David Loy, another Buddhist scholar, contends that it must be repressed for us to function with psychological comfort. Ernest Becker, in Denial of Death, argues that everything that people do in their symbolic world is an attempt to deny and overcome what he calls this grotesque fate. People build defenses in order to feel a basic sense of self-worth, of meaningfulness, and of power. We, and I here I definitely include me, I want to feel that we are somebody who can or would like to control our lives and perhaps even our deaths, because we each can live and act as a free individual with a unique and self-fashioned identity. So before I end this Buddhist analysis, let me return to karma. Peter Hushok, another Buddhist scholar, introduced the concept of the karmic accelerator. It takes our human karma, that is our values and intentions, apply them at machine scale, that is at an astonishingly accelerated pace, and return that back to us. Hence, any new synthetic intelligence is not generating its own data, but making use of human intelligence that's already stored in our storehouse consciousness to shape human beings, to shape how we become. So the digital world is a good example. Have you noticed how advertisements and even search results are customized according to the last thing you browsed or bought? By feeding back to us what we wanted, the digital medium gives us an illusion of free will, convenience, and freedom of choice. We have instead, inadvertently, created a karma of craving that is one of continual dissatisfaction, governed by a primal sense of lack at personal, communal, and institutional levels. How often have you heard of a company that says it has made enough profit, have enough customers or students, have enough staff who are sufficiently productive and capable? I hope to have made sense of the discoveries of both scientists, religious studies scholars, and social scientists in this short analysis. The Anthropocene came about because of our primal confusion, that is our sense of lack, to mask the truth of non-self and our inevitable death. And as we equip ourselves with more and more technological power to pander to our desires, the karmic accelerator send us two epidemics, coronavirus and the psychic epidemic. And the latter is more lethal. Zoloft's call for us to interrupt our lives is the necessary pause to fully appreciate what is misguiding or delusional inside and outside ourselves. So let's not just blame the, the epidemic or the pandemic because all the conditions that have led to the pandemic, we should have paid attention to. And the pandemic is giving us an opportunity to pause and to reflect like we are doing now. In the next section, I will look at the Buddhist sutras or the ancient teachings to identify possible wisdom to resolve the bind that we are in. Lately, I've been studying the perfection of wisdom literature. So let's start there. I'm drawn to a statement in this ancient text, which dates back to 179 Common Era. It says, quote, 
that thought is not thought because that thought is essentially clear of characteristics. I know the philosophers among you must be very delighted with this cryptic statement. So let me try to unpack this a little. As human beings, we are constituted of thoughts, among other experiences that I've mentioned in our consciousnesses. During meditation, we become more aware of these thoughts. And I hope that the minute um, mindful check-in that we did at the beginning of the program helped you to be aware of some thoughts that may have sprung up. And besides the arising of these thoughts, also the cessation of the thoughts. Some of these thoughts are accompanied by positive or negative feelings which then lead us to generate more thoughts. So what we often call a train of thoughts. How then can we be free of thoughts? So it is not to generate yet another thought that says, I want to stop the flow of thoughts. That's not what we are supposed to do in the meditation. It is like trying to sleep by continuously telling myself, sleep, sleep, sleep. And as some of you may know, that call to sleep only results in greater wakefulness. So according to this statement in the Perfection of Wisdom text, it is not to have no thoughts, but not to be attached to any characteristics of thoughts that arise or cease. So when I see a cup of tea, I should just observe that recognition of tea that arises in my consciousness and that fades away. Rather than to be attached to the characteristic of tea, such as its fragrance or the benefits of tea. So it's to just observe and let the thought come and let the thought go. It would be even worse if even after I've left the space where the cup of tea was, I still keep thinking about that cup of tea and wish that I had taken a sip. So that's not the train of thoughts that we want to entertain. So in other words, non-thought is not the absence of thought, but rather allowing thought to arise and fade away freely, and we do not get stuck or abide in anything. So that's the meaning of that thought is not thought because that thought is essentially clear of characteristics. What does that mean in real life? Let's point back to the groundless, signless, and emptiness of the nature of all things. The emptiness being it's empty of all characteristics, clear, essentially clear of all characteristics. How can that help us to be less desirous and more contented? So let me illustrate with one example. Some, an example that I'm familiar with and I'm sure you are too. If I should notice this familiar red sign above my social media icon that says, I have a notification. Do I next detect the arising of an urge in my mind to open that app? But just at that moment, can I pause and observe the next thought or my motivation? So instead of acting on the thought, let me just observe. Is my ego consciousness hungry to be noticed or liked? If I can allow myself to fall into emptiness, other creative possibilities may arise. For example, I can return to my task at hand, which is to continue this lecture, be it, or it could be, it could be listening to this lecture. So by not feeding my ego over the next few minutes, I may instead be flowing back to the present moment. Let me share with you this quote from the Dhammapada, a um, text that's purported to be the words of the Buddha, very early words of the Buddha. It says, hunger is the greatest illness. Contentment is the greatest wealth, unquote. By hunger, I do not think the Buddha 
or author was referring to physical hunger, but rather our insatiable desires. A contented orientation toward life does not require a flat renunciation of all material possessions. I'm not advocating everybody become a monastic. Rather, it specifies an attitude to be cultivated and expressed whether one is rich or poor. To be content with what one has, regardless of its material value, is an expression of wisdom. The wisdom of the emptiness of any substantive characteristics associated with the object. So instead, contentment is the natural accompaniment of this attitude of non-attachment. So let us take a quick look at how the perfection of wisdom together with other attitudes can be instrumental in reducing materialism, a malaise of today's society. Stefano Pace conducted a global survey of 348 respondents in which she studied why commitment to Buddhism helped people curb materialism. Her study reveals that these respondents guided by Buddhist teachings can do three things. One, detach from the cycle of desires. So I explained that earlier. Two, are able to frame their personal identity as an illusory construction. So a construction based on the ego consciousness over a storehouse consciousness that's constantly in flux anyway. And three, to consider the interdependence of all elements. In addition, as consumers, they are better able to cultivate the four immeasurables and the four immeasurables in Buddhism are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. These values help to synthesize the Buddhist posture towards society and fellow citizens, something I will turn to very soon. So the Dhammapada, as I've mentioned, is a popular text of sayings attributed to Buddha. It begins with this quote, mind precedes all knowables, minds their chief, mind me are they, unquote. So this is why mindfulness is a key practice in Buddhism. In a world filled with unknowns and crises, the best place to begin our practice as a human is the mind. I know that my default state of mind should be one of peace and contentment. And I should be aware when that mood is disturbed. So the mindful check-in app at the beginning of our time together today, I hope has helped each of us access this state of inner peace, what we call the harmony of joy within oneself. However, it is not enough that I and I alone I'm the most peaceful and contented person in my family. If I live with a quarrelsome family, then my peace cannot last very long. It is why many people who come to our Nantian retreats return home to find their peace vanishing with every passing day. As humanistic Buddhists, we want to find ways to bring peace to the people we live with as well. This may be through skillful means, such as playing soft music, dedicating time to use meditation apps together, and setting up a quiet corner in the family room. Allow peace and happiness to permeate through one corner at a time, one moment at a time, with lots of patience and supported by inner peace. So that's harmony of cooperation within the family. Of course, during the day, we meet more than our family members. We meet our colleagues, classmates, friends, or even strangers through Zoom, and perhaps sometimes on the streets. The goal is to let our inner peace and joy permeate our conversations 
and respectfully engage with everyone we meet. Perhaps even send a birthday greeting or a care package to someone we know or someone in need. So that is the harmony of respect between self and other. We hear of so many injustices and sorrow these days. And some of these happen in our neighborhoods or even happens to ourselves. Recently, I was rather upset with the inequitable access to vaccines causing so much suffering globally. Despite the rapid development and clinical success of COVID-19 vaccines, patterns and trade secrets prevent the widespread distribution of these vaccines to poorer countries. We also note that there are now more than 4.5 million deaths related to the COVID-19 pandemic and 120 million more people pushed into extreme poverty, while billionaires are growing richer. We know that countries which have access to vaccines are likely to recover more rapidly. I cannot see myself meditating peacefully on my mat while all this is happening around the world. But fretting about such social turmoils and inequalities will do little good. Instead, I want to ensure that I always keep as many people as possible in my prayers, in my daily chanting, and support as many noteworthy causes as possible. By the way, what you see on the PowerPoint is the um, main shrine of Nantian Temple. And on that day, different faith groups were coming together for world peace prayer. So that is the harmony of unity in society and harmony of peace throughout the world. This is how I've tried to interpret and put into practice the five harmonies teachings of my teacher, Venerable Master Xing Yun, which are the harmony of joy within oneself, of cooperation within a family, of respect between self and other, of unity in society, and of peace throughout the world. Hence, even for a world in crisis, the key in humanistic Buddhism is to start from inside, inside ourselves, and work our way out to the rest of the world. We have to first begin by empowering ourselves. I'm indebted to my teacher, the Venerable Master Xing Yun, for his humanistic Buddhist social ethic. He infuses generosity, kindness, compassion, wisdom, sharing, cooperation, and many other humanistic values in what he says, writes, and does. The master sets up two organizations, Fokwangshan for monastics and Buddhist Light International Association for lay followers. These two communities advance their objectives through the practice of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the four immeasurables I mentioned earlier in Stefano Pace's research, by appreciating any given blessings, and advancing friendship towards everyone, they believe that they will realize the fullness of our inherent power that we call Buddha nature. With meditative concentration, contemplation of the Buddha's name, and upholding the precepts, we hope to experience the wisdom of the Buddha. Our vows will eventually be fulfilled with the foundation of humility and gratitude toward all, building, all beings. Thousands in these two communities commit themselves to cultural, educational, charitable, and religious activities in the hope of benefiting society by bringing relief to those who are suffering under exploitative systems. Under the guidance of the Venerable Master's vision of everyone being global citizens in coexistence, BLIA members have donated respirators and PPE equipment to places in need, planted trees, and encouraged vegetarianism worldwide. There is no dearth of activities to keep the public engaged and connected during trying times. Here in Nantian Institute, we initiated a detox series soon after lockdown was announced in early 2020. When the global situation did not ease six months later, 
the Communities of Practice launched weekly 30-minute Sunday check-in sessions. This enabled people from around the world to connect, develop the habit of a pause, check in on one another, and to build a culture of care. Gradually, global friendships developed over Zoom, resulting in an ethical and compassionate posture that will serve to halt delusive thoughts, speech, and behavior. One person at a time, one community at a time. I'm happy to report that we just celebrated our first anniversary last Sunday, and you're most welcome to join us uh, using the web link communities.nantian.edu.au. Okay, time for a summary. I started my presentation with Laurie Zoloff's call for us to voluntarily interrupt our lives by listening to the evidence. The external signals are clear. Climate change, environmental degradation, COVID-19 pandemic, and the threat of the sixth mass extinction that will be caused by human activities. The solutions are not entirely difficult either, yet we are steeped in a psychic epidemic that prevents right action. Rooted in fear, our minds feel vulnerable and fearful and hence construe a reality based on that fear. In a rather lengthy Buddhist analysis, I tried to explain what's, what teaching after teaching is cautioning its readers about. Sentient beings are fooled by our sensorium. The perceived constancy of a self is actually in a state of flux. Our actions are motivated by our greatest fear, which is death, and our greatest confusion, that there is an eternal self reinforcing the endless appropriation of anything that substantiates our becoming. So instead of operating from a happy position of sufficiency, many people are trapped in a dreadful state of lack. There's a Chinese proverb that says, he who ties the bell has to untie it himself, meaning whoever creates a difficult situation must resolve it himself. The perfection of wisdom literature reminds its readers not to cling on to or become too attached to any characteristics. Not only can one become less desirous and less attached, but we can also cultivate positive qualities such as immeasurable loving kindness, com compassion, joy, and equanimity. The five harmonies starting from inner peace, working through family and interpersonal relationships and onto the society at large, offers a step-by-step -step path towards world peace. So coming together in communities with like-minded individuals is now becoming easier with technology. So let's harness the power of communities to turn the tide of crisis. And I must say, I'm very, very touched by the community pantries in the Philippines. Your slogan is very moving. Give according to your means, take according to your need. And for that, I really am so grateful to you. In Wise Hope, in the time of the pandemic, Roshi John Halifax defines wise hope as opening ourselves to what we do not know and cannot know. Wise hope permits us to perpetually be surprised. In her wisdom that derives from much practice on the ground, she encourages us to look at the truth of suffering, that it exists and its potential to be transformed for the better or worse. So, in reality, either direction of better or worse is possible. Which way it goes depends on us. And I suspect that we are all here together in this Zoom space because we want to create a more hopeful and a better future. And so the next part is going to be a little more exciting. We are not ending yet. If you just give me a few more minutes, I'm going to invite you to a group activity. The Buddhist concept of hope is based on impermanence. Buddhists know for a fact that things will change. So we want to bear good intentions and act for positive change. Conditions will improve one consciousness stream at a time. So I ask you now to imagine a world where every person is not forced into lockdown, but we can make moral choices 
to limit our carbon footprint and build a sustainable planet for future generations. Instead of an interruption forced upon us, let us develop the habit of a voluntary pause. So now we will break out into groups of five or six, and I would like us to co-create our future. Based on what you have heard just now, discuss what kind of future you would like to imagine. It could be a vow, it could be an action, how you wish to live, what you care about or what you care for. Try to be as specific as possible in a discussion and take into account what that collective future may look like. And when you return, we can invite everyone to put your, your vision into the chat stream if you're allowed to key into the chat. And um, then we can have it collective, our collective um, composition of what our future may look like. So what kind of future do you want to leave behind? What is it that you can create? Then I would like to invite everyone to share what kind of a future you would like to co-create, what you would like to see in the chat. Thank you. A more harmonious world. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Yes, the government leaders are so important, having these um, noble gentlemen, noble people in the government. How lovely. Yes. Now, let me just stop share. That may help everyone to see the uh, chat session. Peace without war, without racists. Thank you. No more fear of the pandemics, definitely. Encouraging people around for plant-based diet. Yes, be compassionate to all animals because they are our friends. We're all interconnected. Yes, a world without hunger. Very basic. Without the fear of hunger. Thank you. Safe resumption of schools. Caring about students being able to go back to schools. That's right. It's actually very hard homeschooling. A world of open discourse and learning. Yes, thank you. No more discrimination of any sort, be gentle, gender or races, a world without poverty, greater equality. Yes, I'd like to co-create a future of simplicity and non-attachment to material things and artificial needs. Indeed, thank you. To recycle and reuse more, yes. Maybe even to upcycle. Having responsible government leaders, that's great. This is, you know, if we can put all these together, if we can put our vision together, just think of how beautiful this world will be. So I think we have to start with a vision. So that goes into our consciousness. And with that consciousness, we can see what little thing we can do one step at a time within ourselves, with our family, with people we meet. So if, if our conversations are always positive, remember we are all interconnected. So if our conversations can be positive, that is what's going to make the world turn, going to make the um, consciousness stream turn one stream at a time. Such, such beautiful messages. You know, every one of you must save this. We have to save this co-created um, vision of our future. That's so beautiful. And I think we should print this on, on some beautiful sheet and pass it to our government leaders. So this is what we have created today on the 8th of October with a global community. This is what we want to see. So keep that going, my friends. Keep putting in your vision in here. This, this mage, I think we have to collect this <laughs> and honor everybody's vision in a way and send it back to, um, to the powers to be. So while you keep continue to please um, put your inputs into the chat stream while I continue to share screen and hopefully we can 
get to the end of my presentation soon. So I'm going to share screen, but don't stop your great visions. Keep that going. So these are bibliography for your reference if you are interested. Credit for this presentation goes to the research of many whom I've quoted today, and I alone bear any responsibility for mistakes in judgment. So we mentioned the Humanistic Buddhism Symposium earlier. We are, so in, a, in just a month's time, Nantian Institute has the, has the privilege of co-organizing this um, it's International Symposium on Humanistic Buddhism with Fo Guangshan Headquarters Institute of Humanistic Buddhism. We are very privileged that our keynote dialogue will be held between Emeritus Professor Louis Lancaster, one of the top, if not the top, Buddhist studies scholar worldwide, and Australia's top social researcher, Hugh Mackay, who himself is a Christian, and they will share their life experiences around crisis for the first 45 minutes with an opportunity for the audience to ask questions for another 45 minutes. And the topic is never waste a crisis, a human response to disruption. So I welcome you to uh, join us in this, I think definitely very exciting conversation. Our first international panel speaks to creating an inclusive society and uh, friends from all over the world some of whom will have to wake up early and some sleep late in order to join in this conversation. So please, if you are, I saw there, there is a fair bit about building a um, society without discrimination. Well, come to this panel so that we can co-create that future together. Second panel looks at complex systems. Um, that we entwine ourselves in, you know, we, we keep building this. So what are the challenges in this complex system? How do we build a more humanistic society? And again, we have friends from around the world as well. So do join us. The Australian response is hardly heard in many um, international platforms. So we use this opportunity to share some Australian voices. Um, you're welcome, of course, to listen to those. Fourth panel looks at Buddhist adaptations today, um, especially from a humanistic Buddhism um, perspective. The fifth panel looks at health and well being, something that we are all quite concerned about. So please join us in this particular panel. And the final panel explores how the Nantian Institute and the community at large put compassion into action. So do save the dates of the 6th to 8th November to join these international panelists to co-create a future based on our intrinsic human goodness. Registration is now open and um, our um, videos, um, the various video presentations are already online. So you can, take, you can take a preview of some of the video presentations, but you want to register to get a Zoom link so that you have an opportunity to dialogue with all our speakers live. So please allow me to end today's lecture with two quotes. First is an extract from Go to the Limits of Your Longing, a poem by late 19th century German poet, Rainer Maria, Maria Rilke, he says, let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Yes, no feeling is final. COVID has taught us that no mutation is final. And so we cannot expect to abide by any form of feelings. And finally, is an extract from David White's Coleman's Bed. He says, live in this place as you were meant to, and then, surprised by your abilities, become the ancestor of it all, the quiet, robust, and blessed saint that your future happiness will always remember. Take heart. 
that we are always sowing the seeds of our future happiness. Have faith in our quiet, robust, and blessed sainthood or Buddha nature. Thank you, everyone, for this hopeful future. And in closing, I just want to thank a few people who have assisted me in preparing this slide, Dr. Jonathan Page for helping me with some of the research, Grace Ewart for producing this beautiful PowerPoint, and my communities for their support and encouragement, especially at a time when you know, coming together is quite difficult. May the merits of today's presentation be dedicated to everyone's safety and well-being. I look forward to the next part, where together we are going to co-create the answers to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Venerable Dr. Jue Shi. Indeed, I feel like I was in the state of trance um, like all throughout the lecture, and I'm so glad to have heard from Venerable Doctor. The lecture really calls for us to ponder and do introspection from time to time. And this pandemic is not permanent. And we believe that we can thrive through this. And this is not the end of the tunnel for us. And I know that the audience right now same, uh, share the, the same sentiments as I am. And so we are going to proceed with our Q and A portion. Um, so, we have the following reminders. Um, all questions must be asked through chat, but since the um, chat box has now, been, has now been open for everybody, so you can now type in your questions publicly in the chat, or you can still privately message it to um, this particular uh, name, Sophia Threshadar. And you are only permitted to turn on your microphone during this portion if you have any follow-up queries from your previous question. And we only cater only up to one follow-up question is allowed. So um, I know um, the minds are curious and there's still a lot going on to inculcate and to internalize everything Venerable Doctor has taught us to this afternoon. So I'm gonna give people the time to key in their questions. But before that, I'm gonna read um, uh, an insight from one of our audience today. Uh, uh, so I'm going to read it to you, um, doc, Venerable Doctor. Can you hear me well? Just interrupt yes. me if, if I'm an up off. Okay, thank I you. I can hear you well. Thank you, Mage. All right, so here goes. Ami Tuufu. First, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to the facility and administration of the University of San Carlos for this event. Warm gratitude to Dr. Jue Shi for sharing with us her magnanimous thoughts on humanistic Buddhism and systematic collective karma. Upon listening to your wonderful talk, I am but compelled to compare such with Murray Bookchin's social ecology and that of Pope Francis' integral ecology in his Laudato Si. Your talk further encourages us that we continue to aspire to take this opportunity being brought about by the pandemic. This is the hope towards positive change in the future if we develop a habit that is free from selfishness and anthropocentric thought, but rather content ourselves with our oneness with the entire creation. Thank you so much for the feedback. Indeed it is. I think whatever traditions we belong to, now is the time for us to come together that interconnectedness, and if we all can think positively, we can co-create, I think, a very beautiful future. Thank you. Thank you for that, Venerable Doctor. And so we have um, a question. Um, yes. It is privately messaged to me. Sure. So she asked, how do I heal disconnection from a family member who doesn't want to be reconnected? I repeat, how do I heal this disconnection from a family member who doesn't want to be reconnected. I'm sorry to hear that. And I think that there must be many causes and conditions. In Buddhism, we believe that a lot of things come, arise out of conditions. And when those conditions cease, 
then there will be a change. So if we want to work on a certain effect, we have to first recognize those conditions. I once heard on a science, on a, um, the Science of Happiness podcast. So this is UC Berkeley. They have a Science of Happiness podcast and they have different habits that people can do. And one of those habits or one of those activities was to bring two persons who no longer talk to each other anymore. And they come together one day and they decided that they will start to speak to each other. So they're facilitated by, um, you know, there's this task, there's a task sheet that says, okay, you answer these questions. And so there's some of these neutral questions that each of them has, a, has, has a, um, the same list and they started talking. So it was only required for them to do 20 minutes and they went on for two hours. And the two friends finally reconciled because they were able to step into each other's shoes and see what happened. And that was from an incident that happened in their childhood when they were still classmates and now they are already working adults. So that hurt has been born in their minds for decades. And that particular activity brought the two people together to reconcile by stepping into each other's shoes. So I'm, there could be potential opportunities like this that we could explore. But first, I guess, is the openness on both sides to want to reconcile. And I, I pray that you will be able to do so with your family member soon. Thank you, Venerable Doctor. Now for our next question. In a country like the Philippines, where it almost seems like the overwhelming majority are going against the values being espoused in this lecture today, how do we handle and face such adversity without compromising our own well-being? This is from Mr. Ronan Ko. Thank you, Roland, for the question. I often use the example of cogwheels. So I am a little cogwheel, very, very tiny cogwheel in this huge universe. And I go in a particular direction. Now, I cannot turn the big cogwheel called society or the nation, but I can turn one tiny cogwheel beside me. So if I, the two cogwheels turning in the same direction can then turn the third cogwheel and the fourth and the fifth. And these tiny, tiny cogwheels turning in the same direction can then turn a medium-sized cogwheel. So that could be maybe a community cogwheel. And this other community cogwheel can then get together with another community cogwheel and start turning in that same humanistic direction. That then means what? Votes or <laughs> whatever that is that will then turn the big national cogwheel. It may take a long time. It may even take lifetimes. It may be the future generations where things, where the changes may take place, but that's all right because we know that we are going in the right direction. I think what's important is that we must have inner power. So to us, of course, is, um, the Buddhahood or what was called the sainthood that's in us. So let's just start building that energy. I can't turn any cog wheels if I am a mobile phone flashing red, no battery, no battery. I can't. So I have to fill my battery first. So I want to encourage everyone to practice self-compassion. Start with some self-care. Start by generating the loving kindness that's within ourselves so that we can radiate that kindness from ourselves, radiate the compassion from ourselves, radiate that peace from ourselves. With that, it will be much easier to turn others without ourselves feeling like we are being turned by the bigger forces out there. 
all the best. All right, thank you indeed. Um, compassion, really an essential thing today. Um, for right. our next questions, well, um, does avoiding the desires would not put someone to a nihilistic life? This, is, this question comes from Rain. Does avoiding the desires would not put someone to a nihilistic life? Yes, something that we really need to watch out for, nihilism. So we know that there, is, there are two extremes. One is a very materialistic, you know, existentialist type of world. And then there is another which is nihilistic. So nothing exists. It doesn't matter. You know, I can, I can do anything I want. But after all, I'll be gone. Nothing, nothing will exist anymore. We believe in Buddhism. We believe in the middle way. It's between these two extremes. It doesn't mean that we don't have any more desires. It's that. We are not attached to those desires. So that when, for example, well, once upon a time I can fly, I could have flown to the Philippines to deliver this lecture. But now I can't even leave beyond five kilometers of where I stay, let alone fly. I can't even get to the airport now. So I would not get attached to the desire to fly. I do what I can now. It's not that. I have been nihilistic. No, I still know that I have a desire for, for example, to do good research so that I can present a reasonable lecture today. And I still have a desire for compassion. I still have a desire to towards all the good things that you have put into the chat today, towards building that but I'm not attached unnecessarily and also not attached um, in such a way that it will cause suffering to myself and to people around me. So therefore, it will not be nihilistic. I hope that helps, Ray. All right, thank you, doctor. Um, another question. Good day, venerable. I would like to ask if you have any thoughts on what concrete steps in a personal, communal, and national level we can take to combat this culture that encourages insatiable want and a constant feeling of lack from Christian Ian. Thank you, Christian. Well, I wish I can answer that. I can start with myself, right? So I took the monastic path to kind of renounce from some of these um, materialistic desires. However, I'm not asking you to do the same, but within our capability, perhaps we can see how we can mm, leave a smaller carbon footprint. Maybe we can start with, um, looking at ways in which I could reframe my lifestyle. And you know, there are other kinds of um, kindness we could do. It may not be just materialistic. It could be the way we speak. How can I be gentler in the way we speak so that we can create less harm for others? And as I always say, we start with ourselves. If we can become a positive example, we'll become a magnet for others to want to do the same. I can tell you many, many, many people have asked me, how do you maintain your smile all the time? Because they want to do the same, right? So it's the same, we have to start with a joyous heart ourselves and then that will radiate out onto others. And people say, how did you do? I want to do that too. And then you got an opportunity for a conversation. So let's start with ourselves. Can we be more contented? Can we be more peaceful? Can we be, and, and the trick is not to compare actually. The less comparison we do, the more contented we will be. Have you ever noticed that very often if we are just in our own circle, we are, we are actually quite good. It's only when we found out, huh, how come my neighbor has that and I don't? <laughs> that we start to, to have a little bit of an upheaval in our minds. 
a lot of meditation practice also helps. I think that helps me. The Reflective Pauses, the Mindful Check-In app is a free app that's downloadable on your mobile phone that you can use anytime. It's my, it's, I think, my savior. Um, the Mindful Check-In app as well as the Communities of Practice Reflective Pauses is only 30 minutes every Sunday. But that 30 minutes really helps to inculcate that practice in me to stop, to pause before I go into my auto mode, which is to get more and more and more. So let's be more mindful. Thank you. All right. Um, so this is a question coming from Trey. How do we share with others the practice of meditation in order for them to learn to calmly go through life and let things flow? Thank you, Trey. Maybe just start with one minute. I but the reason I developed the Mindful Check-In app is because people say they have no time to meditate or they think they can't. But when I tell them one minute, they say can. So start with one minute. Okay, such a concise yet meaningful answer. Uh, for the next question coming from um, Renz, what do we do with those people who reject this way of living as taught in this lecture? those people who still want to live their cravings or wants because they believe in the idea of personal freedom and you only live once, those people who are indifferent. Friends, I can't solve all problems. <laughs> I can only, I think, I can only talk to the 300 people here who are in this room. But if there are 300 people here with that, vision that we have, I think we are a bit mega force already. And slowly, we hope to be able to, maybe not them, but their children, their grandchildren that they, whom they care for. And slowly, we have to melt people's hearts. That's what skillful means is about. We have to find out what is it that will melt their hearts and allow that defrost uh, defrosting to take place. All right. So for the audience, um, I'm sorry for the time constraint, but we're only going to be catering three more questions. Um, but I know that you're all still um, hungry for more wisdom and knowledge. Um, so this next question it comes from Charito Pizarro. Would you say that the regular and conventional guidance and counseling centers in schools and universities should espouse the strategy that you mentioned about reconciling two persons who were no longer talking to each other? Actually, there are many tools out there. I think research can be done to look at different ways to resolve conflicts. You know, peace comes from the individual. I, I can't highlight enough, but I guess possibly because humanistic Buddhism also starts from, for us, a meditation lineage. So meditation is very helpful to us to still and calm minds down because when the mind is calmer, it's easier to talk. When, when you know, when you have waves, let me share with you something. Recently, I went to a park and I looked at ripples in the river. Ripples. You know how you go, Dum, and then there's a ripple, and this is perfect concentric circles. They're so beautiful until they meet the next ripple. And then you see what happens. That thing, it, it's no longer the same shape. They merge. You no know, different things could happen. Maybe the bigger ripple will, will um, cover that. But there's also something else. When the ripples are small, I can see clearly the reflections on the, on the river bank. But the minute the winds come along and the ripples become waves, I can't see the reflections anymore. There's no clarity. So first of all, let's get rid of all those waves in our mind. Let's see things clearly, be at peace, be in harmony. Talk will be easy. Thank you, Venerable, for our um, second to the last question. Good afternoon from Samuel. 
What could be a good mantra to say to ourselves in times of being tempted to desire more than what we need? <laughs> That's a good mantra. <laughs> mm, what's a good mantra when we want to desire more? Hmm, interesting. Because I don't know. It's a good mantra. I have my own mantras, but I don't think that's that may work for all. Okay, let me just share my little secret. <laughs> so whenever I get into any trouble, and which I always do, I will always run to a particular um what I call bodhisattva. She's called the Guan Yin Bodhisattva. I think the equivalent in, in um, the Catholic tradition, maybe, what is it? Mary, um, yeah, Mother Mary. Yes, compassion, right? Loving kindness and compassion. So I always run to her and say, save me, save me, right? And when she says, when she says that, then the next thing I do, I will go out to nature and look at nature for messages. So recently, I went to out and look at the trees and I saw the bark of the trees and there was all these cracks. So I go like, oh dear trees, you're so, you're so poor thing. You must be suffering. And then I hugged the tree and the tree came back and told me this. He says, growing pains. And then the tree whispered in my ear, you too. <laughs> So I went back to the Guanyin Bodhisattva and I said, ah, I know. We are all going to go through all these difficulties in our lives. It's all part of growing pains. It's okay. Be a little bit more merciful on myself. I don't have to be perfect all the time. The partial moon, is still as beautiful as the full moon and it's okay. So God, it's okay. I don't have to be perfect. I, I still can have my ice cream and I can still have my, oh my, Naughty little things, and it's okay. Oh, all right, that was that was entertaining, a venerable doctor, to hear from you. Um, so for the last question, um, I think this is really the core of our topic uh, for this lecture. What is humanistic Buddhism, and how is it different from other strands of Buddhism? Thank you so much for this question. I once asked the Venerable Master Sheng Yuan, I said, huh, what is humanistic Buddhism? And he told me, you will not understand it unless you practice it. It's not something to be, you know, verbalized. At that time, I got really upset, right? But like, I just want an answer and I can't get it. But now I realize why. Okay. Humanistic Buddhism is something that we have to practice with people and it changes with time. So recently, my most recent, um, I guess, my insight into humanistic Buddhism is everyday dharma for everybody. It's everyday dharma, which means that it is practice. Dharma is like the truth. So everyday kind of practice that I can do at any time and to anyone. So it, is, it equalizes the playing field. Everyone can be, everyone. For example, we all have the same vulnerability. We call it suffering, but we all have that vulnerability. We all suddenly, because of the pandemic, feel the vulnerability of our mortality. We are all equal. So it's, humanistic Buddhism has to understand the equality of humans. And with that, with that, then we can operate and appreciate that whoever out there who is doing these crazy things, even these um, shareholders who are very rich and still wanting to get richer, they operate from this position of lack and fear, just like us. These people who are, who are trying to make more and more money when other people are getting poorer and poorer, they are all equal in suffering. Now that immediately again equalizes the playing field. So I can now send my compassionate thoughts to them. I have growing pains, so does he. So does she. 
So does everyone else. So humanistic Buddhism to me, and especially during this particular period, grounds me. Grounds me into understanding that why it is so important for us to be compassionate, to understand the interconnectedness, because everything I say and do and think is not me alone. It's all of us. That virus has equalized us and made it very clear that all of these problems that, have, that we are seeing actually occurred before. It's because we are now still, we see it better. And we all have the power and the responsibility to respond. How we respond, one, one, one consciousness at a time is going to make the difference. So I hope that today, you know, all of us together will be able to move in that direction where we appreciate our humanness. We appreciate each other's, one another's vulnerabilities. We appreciate how we want to create a better future for future generations. That's our responsibility and we do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Dr. Jue. And I, you know, I regret to say, but that concludes our question and answer. I know everybody wants to hear so much from Venerable today, since this is a once in a bloom and chance for us to speak with her. And I hope that one day we could like just sit on a table and talk about life as it is uh, over snacks or a cup of coffee, but that's not possible. But at least today we have a chance to hear our esteemed speaker for today and about humanistic Buddhism. And to proceed with our um, program for today, we are now going to be presenting the certificate. Okay, presentation of certificate for Venerable Dr. Jue. Um, so this certificate is presented by Dr. Ruby Suazo, the chairman uh, the department chairman of the De Department of Philosophy and also the Sophia president, Thresha Grace Starr. This certificate of appreciation is given to Venerable Dr. Ju Wei as a guest speaker for the 8th Virginia Jaime lecture given this 8th day of October 2021. Okay, let's give um, our speaker a virtual round of applause. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Suatze. Thank you, Thresha. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you to everyone for, for this opportunity. I, I'm, it's really a privilege and an honor. I'm so sorry. I, I don't have very much wisdom to give, but I just give from the heart for based on what I know today. <laughs> thank you. Yes. And um, your, your smile is very contagious. I mean, it's it's through the screen, but I can smile when I see a smile, venerable doctor. And I think that was some wholesome lecture for today. And we really need that. We really need this lecture. And I'm very happy for everyone, to everyone who are joining us. Actually, we got over to 300 participants today, and that is the maximum Zoom capacity. And we're very honored on behalf of the whole department and the organization. We thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts. Um, so to proceed with our closing remarks, since our um, Sophia, the, vi the vice president of Sophia cannot be, cannot join us due to connectivity issues, I will be speaking his speech in his behalf. The teachings that we encountered today through the brilliant and profound presentation and lecture by our venerable speaker with regards to humanistic Buddhism speaks to us all as proof that wisdom can serve as a bomb for the troubles and woes pushing down on us daily, both external and internal. It is inspiring that hundreds of people came here to this specific moment in time for a discussion on hope, harmony, and meaningful change. Remember what it is that brought you here today. Remember these lessons when you return to your regular routines and cycles, that we can all foster peace and harmony in our own communities. And it is on us, who we who have come here, to be enlightened to bring back the light back into our world that appears to be getting darker and darker by the day. The global vision of peace is made more certain by your presence here. 
We, the SOFIA organization, your hosts for today. Thank you for thank you all for being here. And we hope that this has encouraged you to bring compassion to your homes in your communities. Thank you, everyone. All right, now to commemorate this very special moment, we will we'll go into be having a series of, of photo uh, opportunities. So we have um, a special, yeah, someone who can capture from a different group. Um, okay, we have a picture taking with Venerable Ji Xing. So we're gonna be posing in front of our cameras um, uh, twice today. So I'm requesting those who are able and those, those whose bandwidths permit to please open their um, cameras so we could, you could be included in the capture of this photo. Thank you also, Venerable Dr. Zhu Wei. Um, I hope this is, isn't the last time that we're going to be hearing from you. Um, yeah, now I feel, I feel so at home in the Philippines. I know that if I go to the Philippines, I have so many friends. Oh, of, of course, of course. I mean, the Filipinos are known for being hospitable and very, very caring for people from the outside. And I hope that one day when you, I mean, you mean to go to the Philippines, you can visit um, University of San Carlos. <laughs> Yay! And, okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you for our guests, um, for people from abroad, for joining us despite the time differences, and for the people behind this event. Thank you very much. Your efforts are not in vain. I'm regret, I'm re I regret to say this, but that concludes our event for today. Once again, I am Thresh Adar, your host for this event, and I hope to see you soon. Stay safe, stay well, everybody.